warm welcome to all viewers and listeners to the first Diplomacy Live podcast. This series will try to unbundle key concepts and dynamics, past, present and future, of diplomacy. In this first podcast, with our guest Dr. Jovan Kurbalia, we will reflect in broad strokes on the interplay between diplomacy and technology. We will start by considering the historical interweaving between something that is a constant of diplomacy, the peaceful conduct of foreign affairs, with something that is fluid, technological innovations that affect diplomacy. In this sense, it is not only technologies that enable better communication, like the telegraph or the internet, but also technologies that stem from security considerations that have an impact. We will seek the wisdom of the past, of what has worked towards peace and what has not. The internet is a major technological milestone, affecting all aspects of societies. As such, it has impacted diplomacy, not least through bringing in new, powerful actors or stakeholders. This is why we will consider how the relationship between all stakeholders in the age of the internet is shaping up in modern times, and the role diplomacy can play. The concluding end offers three main takeaways exactly on this potential role for diplomacy, brought forward from Dr. Kubalia's recently concluded masterclass. Before we start, a few words about our guest, with a full bio available in the summary below. Dr. Jovan Kurbalia is the executive director of Diplo Foundation and head of the Geneva Internet Platform. He has been involved directly in key milestones that have shaped the digital agenda over the past two decades, including being a member of the UN Working Group that defined what Internet governance means, and most recently as the co-director of the UN's high-level panel on digital cooperation. A former diplomat, Jovan has a professional and academic background in international law, diplomacy and information technology. His book, An Introduction to Internet Governance, has been translated in nine languages and is used as a textbook for academic courses worldwide. He lectures in several prominent academic institutions, including the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, the College of Europe, the University of St. Gallen and the University of Southern California. Diplomacy Live Broadcast. Live. Pleasure to start this podcast series uh, with a dear friend, uh, a colleague, and a mentor uh, whom I have known almost uh, 20 years now, um, and who has really spent his professional life on thinking about the topic uh, that we can discuss here, and that is this combination of diplomacy and uh, technology. Uh, Jovan, you've, you've really been, since I know you and much before that, these are the issues that, that you have uh, focused your mind to try to find solutions to uh, most uh, precisely in the internet governance debates, but not only, the whole combination of how diplomacy is being um, impacted and changed at this moment by current technologies is uh, something that uh, you have focused over the years, but technologies have really um, been around uh, for a very long time. They have, uh, in each different epochs, uh, different technologies have had an impact on diplomacy. Can you perhaps just briefly fly us through uh, some of the main ones uh, that has impacted and what has changed over, over this period and what has stayed the same? Dr. congratulations for the, for the start of your uh, podcast. And I think it's a good moment to have a start with a reflection about the evolution of technology and diplomacy. And you, if you go carefully through the history of humanity, you can see this interplay uh, dating back uh, definitely to uh, Mesopotamia of the, or the ancient Egypt, uh, but probably even before that, to the point where our far, far predecessors realized that it was better to hear the message than to eat the messenger. And it was a point where diplomacy started and uh, when then technology added diplomacy with the writing, invention of writing, we always forget that uh, writing is a technology, invention of writing and different way of conveying a message in addition to the direct contact and the direct exchanges. Now, if you move throughout the history, you definitely have the uh, uh, ancient Egypt, uh, the pharaoh Akhenaten, Amenhotep IV, uh, with the first diplomatic archive in uh, uh, Talamarna, uh, then moving uh, through the very busy diplomatic period of the uh, ancient uh, history, 
Why a Persia coming to, to the ancient Greece, ancient Rome, Renaissance diplomacy and modernity? And you have always this interplay, interplay between on one side uh, innovation, innovation in the ways how people communicate. Uh, then we, we, we had uh, back in the history, after writing, we had the smoke signals, we have different pigeon uses, animals and conveyors of the message, and fast forward, a telegraph and, uh, and uh, railway and a different messaging system. That was innovation, constant, and we have now innovations in the way we communicate. And then you have something which we can call tradition or uh, constant in diplomacy. And this constant has been a uh, drive and aim of humans to solve their conflicts through the peaceful means. Unfortunately, this constant had uh, many interludes with the wars. And unfortunately, history is not in that sense ending in our era as we are witnessing today uh, quite, uh, uh, quite a few uh, wars and conflicts where basically military means uh, were uh, managed to win over diplomacy, negotiation, and engagement. Therefore, this is this interplay, continuity of our constant drive to thrive, to solve the con conflict peacefully through negotiation and innovation on the other side, on the ways how, how we communicate, engage, represent, negotiate. And, and this, these technologies, uh, we, can, we can think of uh, really positive ones, uh, Gutenberg's uh, printing press and uh, uh, the telegraph, the telephone, the radio. But really, there is another aspect of, of technology, um, and that is the ones used for war and for, for really the conflict that you mentioned. Um, perhaps we have become spoiled in, in a way that we've had uh, a long period of, of uh, relative calm, of course, uh, without a major war between major powers. And this is the, 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 the key thing. Uh, but this, this interplay of technologies being used for military means uh, is also a part of, of technology, is it not? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, always uh, drive for innovation didn't come from diplomacy. It always come from either uh, security field, military field, or economic field. I would say internet had that interplay with some security concerns after the Sputnik moment when the Soviets launched the Sputnik on the 4th of October 1957 and then the reaction of the United States uh, driven by fear that they were losing the scientific uh, and technology competition, which with, the, with the, this perspective wasn't the case, but that was a moment where NASA was established, where DARPANET predecessor of the internet was established. Therefore, yes, military uh, uh, reasoning and security reasoning has been always an important driver of technological innovation. Uh, in very early days of the mechanic telegraph, Napoleon realized that uh, it had a use for, uh, for military operations. Therefore, one of the first uh, mechanical telegraph lines were used, uh, used uh, by, uh, Napole uh, during Napoleonic Wars. And you have many examples with, uh, with telegraph, with telephone, and later on all of uh, those inventions. So if, if we go back, you know, in, in, in your masterclass, and, and we can put the link here to, to your great masterclass over which you go uh, over the uh, history of, of this interplay between diplomacy and technology, um, what the golden age, uh, as you say, of diplomacy has been really the uh, period between the Napoleonic Wars, about uh, this, this century between 1814 and, and the beginning of World War I, uh, 1914, um, and and if one looks at that period, it's it's it may be a success of diplomacy, but it's really great power diplomacy. And there's not much room for diplomacy for for smaller powers. Uh, perhaps um, they can ally themselves with a major power and and find a way in in that regard. But are we coming back perhaps to this great power uh, competition? that we had gotten accustomed to uh, first in a, in a bipolar world where this st strategic stability uh, perhaps provided some um, possibilities of, of progress, um, but also of, as I said, avoidance of major war. Now we're in the midst of um, really a major war in, in, in Europe uh, with a nuclear powered uh, country. Uh, are, we going, are we going back uh, to this? And, and if so, 
does that mean that diplomacy will again be a major power diplomacy? Well, uh, Lubcho, this is the really old discussion between so-called realist and, uh, let's say, institutionalists in the international relations theory, uh, dating back to uh, Hans Morgenthau and definitely Kissinger, who wrote his diplomacy book and his doctoral thesis, uh, exactly about this period after Vienna Congress, 1814-1815, till the start of the First World War. And uh, uh, that will be ongoing debate. Uh, I would say that uh, Kissinger and his thinking and uh, uh, that type of uh, school was based on, uh, on uh, power concern that, and the basic assumption that individuals like states tend to increase, are driven by the need to increase their power, economic, political, social, cultural power. Therefore, their thinking, and it was the thinking of the negotiators in Vienna uh, in 1814, was, uh, okay, let's start from that, from the power-driven uh, motivation, and see how we can arrange it through negotiation, through mechanisms to control the power, through balance of power, which Kissinger was a uh, uh, big proponent. Uh, that debate will continue. After the Second World War, there was a slight push towards the idea that we can move beyond the power and aim for the public good, develop institutions and benefit more from the cooperation than through that uh, uh, real politic uh, competition. That debate uh, will continue, but just a quick reflection on, uh, on the, this uh, golden age of both diplomacy and technology. This was interesting. That was, that was a period without, with absence of the major conflicts. You had Crimea War, you had 1848, you had the uh, unification of Germany, unification of Italy, then quite a few uh, regional wars. And somebody can argue that, that it wasn't as peaceful period as it is. But there was absence of the major conflict for two reasons. Because in Vienna, big power, mainly monarchies, made some uh, compact that they agreed that they should preserve status quo and their power within their countries. Russia before the establishment of Germany, Russia, UK, and, uh, and, and the, other, the other actors. That was the first point. The second point is that they created carefully balanced mechanisms. And Vienna Congress was a very interesting event, where they spent one year basically having first a lot of fun, many parties. Kaiser spent a lot of, lot of money for entertainment. And it is an interesting lesson because then Versailles uh, peace negotiation 100 years later was more scientific negotiation where you calculate reparation of Germany, when you calculate the peace. And then, as we know, it lasted only two decades. But they created that carefully balanced mechanism. In parallel to that, let me bring then technology. Exactly in this period, you had a tele telegraph, first mechanic, then electronic. You had a telephone, you had radio communication closer to the, to the First World War. And that interplay, I think diplomacy and technology had a really uh, uh, reinforcing some sort of public good, which was absence of the major conflict and absence of the war. And I think that period is still under research, especially Vienna Congress 1814, 1815. We have Kissinger's book, but it's still, uh, uh, I don't think that the messages from that per period are internalized among policymakers who are making decisions today, let's say in managing Ukraine crisis. So in, in the period that, that we have just mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the one century between 1814 and 1914, perhaps there was diplomacy and perhaps there was an avoidance of major power war. Uh, it, it is again this, this kind of interplay of, of, of tension which is there and the balance that you mentioned is at the same time with the tension. And I think that many people uh, forget that uh, when we're thinking of, of this balance of power, this, this Congress of Vienna, uh, 19th century uh, peace, and even obviously the, the, the period after World War uh, too, uh, there is there is this tension. But as you say, it is diplomacy that jumps in through different means and tries to find ways of of, of um, bridging uh, different uh, interests. Um, is this still in the making? Do you think? And please, I mean, if you want to focus on that period, but as well today, because we can learn from this uh, uh, to get insights from it. 
Uh, uh, one point is extremely important. Uh, when the Vienna Congress started in 1814, France was defeated, but France was uh, brought into negotiation through Talleyrand. Talleyrand and Metternich were the, uh, the key sort of uh, architects of the Vienna Congress. Therefore, they were not humiliated, they were not punished, yeah. they were brought back into negotiation. And for any balance of power and any lasting peace, you need to get back uh, the, the side which lost the war. Well, I, I'm referring to almost any war, but in particular, uh, even if it is not, uh, not uh, uh, the military conflict, but also, also lost in the economic and other wars. Yeah. If you compare with Versailles uh, peace, uh, peace Treaty, that was uh, basically a typical humiliation peace treaty where the Germany was forced to pay huge reparation and it was a, treated as a losing power from winning powers, mainly UK, France, uh, to some extent United States and other. That is a crucial point. You have to make sure that there is a face saving option for all sides. Obviously, somebody will have upper hand because of military superiority or economic superiority. But respect for people, respect for their dignity, for the whole countries is extremely important. It existed in Vienna Congress and it contributed to the lasting uh, peace. It didn't exist in Versailles and it brought, uh, well, within less than two decades, the next, next conflict. And it existed so, as well after World War II uh, with, with Germany and Japan. Uh, so it, it, exactly. your point is absolutely uh, on point. We sometimes underestimate emotions. Uh, in uh, we easily calculate number of tanks, GDP, number of people, number of missiles, or whatever. It is important, but emotions are important to motivate people and to uh, to avoid the humiliation. And humiliation ultimately doesn't help anyone because uh, victorious power can be tomorrow losing powers, and that's one wisdom which unfortunately humanity has not gathered from history and in particular from the the vienna congress period and if we fly um to the to the present time um i th there is obviously one of the biggest revolutions uh not just of this past century uh in the past period but really all on the history of humanity is the invention of the internet um and you have spent uh, as i said well, a lot of time in thinking about how to really uh, protect this great resource. Um, you're one of the world's foremost authorities on internet governance. You were involved in the World Summit on um, Information Society in Geneva and onward, uh, a member of the working group that defined what, what it is. Um, and one thing that uh, is interesting, aside from the technology, is the new actors that have come in. Uh, even this concept of multi-stakeholderism uh, really comes from, from these debates on, on, on internet governance. Um, to a point where really the word multilateral became uh, a, a dirty one almost. Uh, um, it, how, is, how has this uh, trust or distrust uh, dynamic been evolving over the past, let's say, 20 years, or has it at all between the stakeholder groups? You know, probably, uh, while you were asking this question, I was thinking, what contributed to... Uh, real good developments but also misinterpretation and probably one should come to the social cultural context in which internet was was invented it was driven by sputnik moment therefore military consideration but the way how internet was developed uh, was related more to social and cultural context of the mainly U u.s universities uh, especially on the west coast in the 60s it was a time of uh, of the um, well, flourishing of the rock, uh, freedom, emancipation, and the idea of inclusion. And the internet came uh, with a, quite a strong social culture undertone as a tool for inclusion, for empowerment, for strengthening public good, for sharing. And when you move fast forward from the this time, 60s, 70s, when this idea was shaped, including TCP IP uh, standard, uh, then the internet uh, was in that initial phase, that element of empowerment. 
And that was among other things which excited me in the 80s when I got my first PC to start experimenting. It was something that can overcome your limitations, physical, get to the other continents, other people engaged through that time, simple email, later on website in the 90s. Now fast forward, that idea inclusion of inclusion, which is behind the multi-stakeholder approach, was suddenly transferred into a different type of internet, which still had this undertone of empowerment, but became also a space for uh, economic, political and military power. Therefore, you had that line of inclusion and multi-stakeholderism, that's, let's say, uh, even to some extent utopian, and then you have now power again. I mean, power is real power. Let's say Apple has the market capitalization of 3 trillion US dollars and the GDP of African continent is 2.6 billion US dollars. We're speaking about real, real power. Economic one, social one over data and, and, and cultural one. Now you ask yourself, can multi-stakeholder model in that in initial philosophy survive? And here the situation is becoming much more complex. And I would say that here we need uh, to brush the dust over the multilateral and bring it back in interplay uh, with multi-stakeholder because governments and states and countries are ultimately uh, responsible for the public good. They have a social contract with their citizens to deliver them security, food, a uh, good political system, respect for human rights. Can they deliver, can African continent deliver when it has less power than some companies? This is a real question. And this is a question when I would say multi-stakeholder approach in its initial format is losing a bit of traction and multilateral is, is, is gaining. Now interplay will be important especially on the issues of legitimacy, because multi-stakeholder approach doesn't have traditional legitimacy yeah. of, uh, let's say, if I go as a diplo at the meeting, I represent diplo, I, and how I can negotiate with somebody representing India, 1.5 billion people. I may have legitimacy because of my expertise, but this is different, different issue. Now, what we have to get back to basics, whom you represent and how you contribute ultimately to the public good. And I would say that uh, multi in multilateral will become bigger and bigger and multi-stakeholder, multi in multi-stakeholder will become slightly smaller. And, but multilateralism really presumes a, a state actor and, and wither the state uh, at approximately the same time, just to, as an illustration, uh, a bit over a year ago, uh, we saw how Twitter and other social media uh, deleted the account of an outgoing president uh, of, of its of its country. While on the other side of the world, uh, the opposite happened. Um, Alibaba, Jack Ma specifically, were if not deleted with significantly clipped uh, wings. So with this enormous power uh, that tech companies are having, um, and, and if we're saying that multilateralism is a way to uh, address it, how can states which are becoming relatively weaker uh, in power, and power is always relative, with these new uh, entities that are entering the international system, how can they cope? I mean, perhaps even the European Union uh, finds it hard, though it has gone quite a bit. Um, my country, a small one, uh, other small countries by themselves um, don't have uh, the possibilities of really of negotiating. They're, they're not at the table even. Uh, it is definitely huge discrepancy in power that that's that's we mentioned some numbers on on April and uh, and others but I would be uh, just correct uh, your your observation with one development which happened during COVID crisis governments are getting back because they have to deliver on the public good on global health therefore companies uh, were a bit uh, 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 less, although tech companies got relevance because of the remote work, uh, Zoom and the other things, but governments were deciding the rules of the game. They were deciding about public health, 
they were uh, uh, voting for the huge economic um, uh, incentive programs. They were decide they are still deciding where you can travel with what type of certificate of the COVID uh, pass or other things. Therefore, governments got some sort of a power on the very common sense approach. They have a social contract with citizens to protect their health. And companies cannot do it. They can contribute to that, but they cannot do. And we are getting here uh, back to the core issue. Can uh, companies deliver on the social contract? To provide security to their citizens, I mean security for the uh, physical well-being, but also health security. Can they provide a, a functional economic system? Can they provide to the large extent not? And this is the role of governments. And I, I would argue that governments will be regaining power in different ways. You mentioned the example of United States, China, European Union, depending on their political system, but you have a general tendency, I would say, in U.S. Congress, in definitely in Brussels, in Beijing, to name just a few capitals, as governments are train, trying to say, hey, we have to deliver on social contract to our citizens, and we cannot do it because we do not have any more means since they're controlled by tech companies. Therefore, that interplay will be, will be much more complex my guess is that governments will be regaining uh, regaining more power but we can we should ask a really basic common sense question if not governments uh, i know it's uh, it is very provocative but maybe tech companies can become new governments i'm not arguing for that and i'm very critical on that point but somebody has to provide security fix roads ensure that the economy functions another maybe companies will be new candidates it will be rather orwellian in the future but we have to have a clarity of discussion what is the purpose of governing and what are the respective roles of all of these actors for me governments should ensure the public order public good companies should provide services contribute with the goods with agility with innovation Civil society academia should ensure that uh, all of major actors, mainly governments and businesses, are kept in the, in the control through some sort of uh, feedback, writing, uh, activities, civil society activities, and other issues. And the internet is the, the, a good medium for that. And it has really, um, on the one hand, served that purpose. It has provided and facilitated a lot of uh, these possibilities of, of health services being uh, brought uh, online, etc. But there's always been this fear, uh, especially among those uh, who are um, specialists in it, uh, of this possibility of what is called splinternet. Uh, since the beginning of the internet governance debate, we've uh, uh, seen a lot of discussions. Well, what if at that time the US, which was uh, its Department of Commerce, uh, was in charge of the top level domain? takes off another country, uh, top, 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 le top level domain, and just takes it off the internet. We had a call uh, just a week ago, I think, uh, by uh, Ukraine to do that with Russia. And uh, on, luckily, this was not adhered to by, by ICANN. Uh, but Russia itself is considering uh, taking itself off the internet. Are we witnessing the fear that many have uh, anticipated, uh, a splinternet, a splintered internet? Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, there is a huge risk, and I think Ukraine uh, war could be a point where we may face the as a one of sort of collateral damages. That term is not very uh, nice to use, but collateral damages could be the end of the internet. We know. I hope it won't happen, uh, but it is important to keep in mind that uh, uh, United States has been benevolent protector of the internet. Even at the time when U.S. had a direct control over the ICANN and domain name system, uh, it never uh, removed the country from the, from the Internet, even in the case when there was a legal basis. Because the Art, uh, Chapter 7 of the UN uh, Charter provides possibility to uh, cut telecommunication links in the case of the sanctions imposed by, by the UN, mainly Security Council. And it happened in the case of Iraq war, ex-Yugoslavia, Somalia, there were quite a few 
UN-driven sanctions which uh, gave the United States possibility to cut the internet from the uh, to cut the country from the internet, basically to delete domain name, technically speaking. There was even court case when Iranian expat community requested the uh, seizure of the Iranian domain by ICANN, and it was refused by Californian court. Therefore, U.S. in the political U.S., uh, economic U.S., juridical U.S. Uh, uh, has been uh, always benevolent guardian of the internet. Uh, it is now tested, and so far I can make the right decision not to remove uh, uh, Russia from the from the internet. But as you indicated, uh, Russia may decide itself, and it started already by, I think, blocking Instagram and a few other services. I'm afraid that it will get worse before it gets better. My only hope is that decision makers worldwide will make a careful calculation of trade-offs. What they are gaining from integrated internet in economic terms, in terms of keeping uh, their, uh, uh, let's say, broader society together. We live on the time of migrants. Many families are kept together uh, via the internet. China has diaspora of more than 80 million people. Therefore, Chinese government has to make a careful calculation for any move of a disintegrated internet. Therefore, that will be, I won't speak about uh, supply chains, about the economy, about issues. Therefore, that's a delicate decision, which has to be made with a, a clearly, uh, clear calculation of benefits and losses and trade-offs. And I guess that many societies worldwide, including societies which are now in the conflict, Russia, Ukraine, but also other societies will have to to uh, uh, to see what uh, they will gain or lose uh, with the possibility of disintegrated internet. I think the losses will be main. They may not be seen currently, but that has to be informed decision. I don't think that it should be put under the carpet. That should be informed decision of society and their representatives, governments, and other actors through proper debate. Um, to conclude, uh, and, uh, I will, let me just play a, a short uh, clip from your masterclass uh, uh, lecture at the end, uh, where you talk about three takeaways. Uh, let me just play that. Our generation should pass to the next, a rich heritage that we received from previous generations. And future generations need to be able to make decisions that are informed by their time and interests. Passing our shared heritage to the next epoch is the public responsibility of us and our generation. This includes preventing the privatization of our common knowledge through, for example, AI-driven codification made by leading tech companies. There will be need for much more effective diplomacy and uh, in policy making along three main aspects. First, we will need more diplomacy than ever before, since in highly interdependent world, military solutions could be very damaging for all involved, including those who may have a stronger military power. Thus, diplomacy as a way of solving conflicts by using peaceful means is becoming more important than ever in human history. But second point, diplomacy will be performed differently. It will require much more bottom-up approach, information and involvement of new actors. And third points are new actors. New actors, from businesses, civil society, governments, religious community, will have to be involved more in policy making and modern diplomacy. It will make modern diplomacy not only more inclusive, but more informed and ultimately more impactful because agreements and deals that were made will be owned by wider community than just uh, let's say, diplomatic services and uh, member states. Therefore, these are three aspects of the major impact 
uh, of the current developments and future diplomacy. Interdependence and diplomacy is a key tool for dealing with interdependence. Second, new ways of doing diplomacy and third, new actors uh, which should join diplomatic negotiation and overall processes. It is important to uh, highlight that as we are shifting in that era, there should be utmost clarity of the roles and responsibilities of each actors, including their legitimacy and including their relevance to the global public good and global public interest. So how do we pass on to the next generations, our, our shared heritage and, and protect it from being privatized? And what is the role of diplomacy in this? Yeah, this is our responsibility, not towards only each other or people who live currently on this rock in the Milky Way, but it is a responsibility also to future generations as we get from the previous generation, more or less civilization in the relatively good shape, culturally, economically, politically. The question is what we are going to pass to the next generation. I won't speak about climate change, about conflicts, but about the internet. Are we going to pass to them a rich heritage that we, we, uh, we got, which is a public good from Aristotle to Tolstoy, Shakespeare, and other to wisdom of the ordinary people? Or is it going to be captured by the artificial intelligence patents, which there is a huge risk? We often focus on data in current discussion, but what is really important is who is going to own and how the patterns of uh, human creativity, invention and reflections. My deep conviction is that it should remain public good as it has been for centuries and we should deliver it to the future generations and give them a chance to create their own world, hopefully better and peaceful than our world, especially these days. Thank you very much. On that note, uh, let me thank you once again for uh, coming to this podcast, for sharing your knowledge and uh, really a great discussion. Uh, always invited uh, back, but uh, to continue a tradition that you started uh, on, on, on the master class, uh, let me raise a, a toast. Uh, and as you say, to peace and prosperity. Cheers. Peace and prosperity. Cheers. Cheers.